This is a hat. These are two hats. And this is Euler's hat. This is Euler's number. But so are these. Now, this Euler's number has a hat on, and his name is Todd. Todd has three friends, Bob, Sarah, and Finn. But why are they wearing hats, you ask? Well, because they're going to a party, of course. Unfortunately, as Todd, Bob, Sarah, and Finn put their hats away, they failed to realize the hats were identical to each other. Only realizing their mistake after a particularly raucous party, Todd is the first to say, well, if we pass them out randomly, a few of us should get the right hat. I mean, what are the chances none of us get our own hat back? Which is a great question. What are the chances something like that actually happens? As wild as it may sound, answering this question can help us answer far more questions in discrete mathematics and computer science that are used in a variety of real-world applications. This probability also has a surprising relationship with Euler's number, but we'll get to that near the end of the video. So, where do we start with this problem? Well, let's first get an intuition of what we are actually trying to find. To find the probability, we need two parts, the total number of possible outcomes and the number of outcomes that fit the criteria. In context, we need to find the total number of ways the hats could have been passed out, and the number of outcomes so that no one gets their hat back. Now the first problem isn't too hard. Imagine it like you're the one passing the hats out. First, you have the choice between four hats, and you pick one to pass out. With that hat passed out, you now have the choice of three remaining hats. You then have two choices of hats, and finally, one hat left to give. Many of you will recognize this as finding the permutations of four items, which of course is four factorial, or 24. If that seems new to you, feel free to check out this video that I made introducing permutations, combinations, and some basic combinatorial problems after this. With this total number of outcomes found, we now want to find the number of outcomes where none of the hats match their original owner. Given how few outcomes there are in the specific problem, we can solve this problem by simply writing out every possible outcome and identifying the ones that fit the criteria. Doing this, we can identify nine possibilities where no one receives their own hat back. Each of these possibilities is called a derangement, a permutation where no element is returned back to its original position. A little notation we can use to denote the number of these is d sub 4, because we are working with four elements, the four hats. But what if there are more than four hats? Well, if you have any idea of how quickly factorials grow, you'll know this method of writing out all the outcomes is insufficient. Even if we only had one more hat, we would have nearly a hundred more outcomes to draw out. So, what we would like now is a general solution. To do this, we'll need to bring in the inclusion-exclusion principle. For a quick rundown of this principle, take the sets 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 and 2, 3, 4, 9, and say we want to find the number of unique elements between both sets. One way to do this is to sum the number of elements in both sets, but doing this means we will be double counting elements that are shared in both sets, so we need to remove these from the count. In math speak, this means to find the number of elements in the union of these sets, we can add the number of elements in both sets, subtract the intersection of both sets. We can do the same thing for even more sets. For example, consider an additional set of numbers 0, 3, 6, 9, 10. Again, we want to find the number of unique elements among these sets, and we can start by adding the number of elements in each set. Like before, we are again double counting elements in the intersection between each set, so we can subtract these from the counts. However, by doing this, we've actually removed more than we needed to, and finally need to add back elements that are shared between all the sets. The pattern repeats when considering four, five, and even more sets. We can summarize this principle with the following equation. Here, this first portion represents summing the number of elements of each individual set. This next portion is removing the double counted elements that are in each pairwise intersection, and so on. With this principle in mind, recall that we want to find the number of derangements for an arbitrary number of elements, which we'll call n. Another way to find the number of derangements is to essentially go backwards by finding the number of elements that are not derangements, subtract that from the number of total elements. Now, to find the number of elements that are not a derangement, we can think of how to go about constructing one example. If we don't want it to be a derangement, that means at least one element is fixed. So, let's denote the set of permutations that fix some element k as s sub k. For example, with n equals 4, s sub 1 would contain the permutations 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, 1, 4, 3, 2, and 1, 3, 4, 2. Notice that the six permutations here match up with the total number of permutations for a set of three elements, three factorial. 
And this is not a coincidence. Because one of the elements is fixed, that means we can think of finding permutations of a set of four elements with one element fixed. The same thing as finding the number of permutations for a set of three elements. You'll also notice that many of the elements in S sub 1 also fix other elements. For example, 1, 3, 2, 4 fixes 1 and 4. So it'd be in S sub 1 and S sub 4, further implying it is in the intersection of S sub 1 and S sub 4. With that in mind, think about how many permutations would be in the set S sub 1 intersect S sub 4. Recalling the example where only one element was fixed, the number of permutations was equal to 4 minus 1 factorial, or in general, n minus 1 factorial. Using the same thinking, the intersection of S sub 1 and S sub 4 are all permutations that fix 1 and 4. So, the total number of permutations that do this would be equivalent to the number of permutations of a set of two elements. Notice how every fixed element subtracts 1 from the amount of inside the factorial, so S sub 1 intersects S sub 4 as 4 minus 2 factorial elements inside of it. So, with n elements and i fixed elements, there will be n minus i factorial number of permutations that fix the specified elements. But how does it help us find the number of elements that are not derangements? Well, we need to find the number of unique permutations that fix at least one element, which, from our discussion of the inclusion exclusion principle, means that we need to find the union of all the s sets. The inclusion exclusion principle says that the number of elements in the union of an arbitrary number of sets is the sum of a bunch of intersections of the sets. Like mentioned above, what we need to do to find the number of derangements now is to just subtract this amount from the total number of permutations possible. However, this formula is obviously extremely ugly and far too unwieldy to actually use, so let's simplify it down. First, the intersection between some number of sets will always have the same number of elements inside it, based on what we saw with the intersection of S sub 1 and S sub 4. So, we can replace the remaining parts with the respective factorial. Given that we're just summing up a constant, that means that all these summations can be simplified by just multiplying these factorials by the number of possible intersections between the sets. However, it is not straightforward to figure out the number of pairwise, triplet-wise, and so on intersections between the n sets that we have. But we can use just a bit more combinatorics by thinking about how the number of intersections, basically the number of unique ways, compare two numbers together that are less than or equal to n. Going back to the example with n equals 4, we essentially need to find the number of ways to arbitrarily pick two numbers where order doesn't matter. That immediately points us to find the combination 4 choose 2. Again, if you need a refresher on combinations, then this introductory combinatorics video I made would be a great resource to help. So, going back to the general case, we can deduce that the number of pairwise intersections of n elements is equal to n choose 2. Similarly, for triplet-wise intersections, it's n choose 3. And so on until we reach n choose n. We are now super close to our final answer, but one last simplifying step we can take is first expanding out the combination notation using the definition of a combination. Doing this, it is clear to see we can cancel out part of the numerator and denominator, vector of the n factorial from each term to leave us with our almost final answer. This little equation is the formula for the number of derangements for a set of n elements, but recall that our original question asked us to find the probability of a derangement. Thankfully, this is not much more difficult, because we should divide d sub n by the total number of possible permutations we found before to be n factorial. And with that, we can now finally find the answer to Todd's burning question. Probability that nobody will get the same hat back is 37.5%. Looks like that scenario is a lot more likely than anyone thought, but on the bright side, there is a hidden e in this equation. Can't see it? Well, recall from calculus that e is equal to the infinite sum of x to the nth power over n factorial. Now, when we write this series out, you may notice we can replace x with negative 1, and voila, we get our answer for the probability. What this means in practice is that the probability of getting a derangement converges to the inverse of e as n gets larger. I think that there's a real beauty in how such a seemingly random number, one that is certainly not an integer, can show up in a discrete problem like this. We can take this a step further by going back to the actual count of derangements by multiplying the probability by the n factorial we divide by, the routing to the nearest integer, to give us an extremely elegant and surprising solution for finding the number of derangements. Frankly, that formula alone was enough to inspire me to make this whole video because of how interesting it is to see Euler's number and a solution to a discrete math problem. What initially seemed like a whimsical exploration of hats and Euler's number turned out to reveal a profound connection between seemingly unrelated concepts. Quest to understand the probability of no one receiving their own hat back, 
let's stay on a path of derangements and the inclusion exclusion principle. By unraveling this problem, we found a formula for calculating derangements, or arrangements where no element returns to its original position. This formula offers a surprising revelation. As n, the number of elements, increases, the probability of getting a arrangement converges to the inverse of Euler's number. So, the next time you don a hat or encounter a seemingly ordinary problem, remember that there might be a touch of Euler's elegance hidden within, waiting to reveal itself through the beauty of mathematical derivation. And with that, we conclude our journey from hats to Euler's number, a testament to the remarkable harmony between the tangible and the abstract in the world of mathematics. Thanks for watching.